just a man got used him for his glory through his brokenness and God is fighting for us where the calls upon his name. Hey, welcome everybody to the Spirit and Truth Podcast. Pastor Mario here. We're in Genesis chapter 19, part two. We're picking it up in verse 12. So if you don't have your Bible, please grab one. And if you do have your Bible in front of you, your phone Bible, your paper Bible, whatever it is, maybe you know the Bible by memory. I've never been able to do that, but I know people who have. Um, Join us and and, uh, let's pray before we uh, get started. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for what it does to our lives, Lord. It changes our lives, Father. It brings us to a place of understanding that is not even human, Father. It brings us to a place of spirituality that is beyond anything we could have ever imagined. And it's because of you, Lord. It's because of your great and awesome love for us. And so, Father, we give you this next half hour or so to pour into us all that is your heart, and your mind, Lord, speak, Father, and teach us now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, uh, Genesis chapter 19, verse 12, Sodom and Gomorrah destroyed. It said, then the men, these are the angels, said to Lot, have you anyone else here? Uh, son-in-law, your sons, your daughters, and whoever you, whoever you have in the city, take them out of this place. For we will destroy this place because the outcry against them has grown great before the face of the Lord, and the Lord has sent us to destroy it. So Lot went out and spoke to his sons-in-laws, plural, who had married his daughters, and said, Get up, get out of this place, for the Lord will destroy this city. But to his son-in-laws he seemed to be joking. When the morning dawned, the angels urged Lot to hurry, saying, Arise, take your wife and your two daughters who are here, lest you be consumed in the punishment of the city. And while he lingered, the men took hold of his hand, his wife's hand, and the hands of his two daughters, the Lord being merciful to him. And they brought him out and set him outside the city. And so it came to pass when they had brought them outside that he said, Everyone, escape for your life. Do not look behind you nor stray anywhere in the plain. Escape to the mountains lest you be destroyed. Well, God is finally moving forward with uh, bringing judgment on a city that is filled with uh, sexual perversion and uh, not only sexual perversion, but sexual perversion accepted as the norm. And, you know, some people say that Lot had uh, several daughters because uh, in the first part of the chapter, he's got two virgin daughters living with him. But now it appears that he has more than one son-in-law. And so if uh, he has daughters that are married, then obviously they're not virgins. Uh, So it appears that he has several daughters. Well, However many uh, daughters he had, it, it, we're reading here that only two are saved. And it doesn't appear that the, that the homosexual men raped them as Lot offered them to do in the first part of the chapter. And so um, the, these two daughters, along with Lot and his wife, uh, they're saved. They're, they're brought out of the city. They're not going to suffer the destruction. This is a picture of things to come. We're actually going somewhere with this. It's, it's a picture of actually the rapture. And the judgment of the world that will be coming in our future. But uh, in the whole city, um, there were not even ten saved. Uh, here there are four people. Uh, Lot's two daughters, Lot and, and his wife. And you know, it makes you wonder, as you look at the story of Lot, if Lot wasn't the, the one to blame for this. Or at least if he's not partly responsible. Because... Look again at uh, verse 14. It says that Lot went out and spoke to his sons-in-law. He said, get up, get out of this place, for the Lord will destroy this city. But it says to his son-in-laws, he seemed to be joking. And so it seems that Lot was a believer. Uh, He had to have been. There's evidence of it. But not only that, being Abraham's nephew and watching Abraham in his walk with the Lord, how can you, you know, And here, of course, he's being saved from destruction. 
And so he was saved, but you wonder if his compromising lifestyle was a bad witness or, or a testimony that had a negative effect on so many people that he knew in the city and even his son-in-laws. And, and who knows about his daughters that were married to these guys. They obviously were destroyed in the city. And so, you know, if you share Jesus with somebody, you always want to make sure that your life reflects a good relationship with him. Because if not, you may find yourself with the same experience that Lot is finding himself with here. They're going to think you're a joke. They're going to say, you know, the guy or the girl, you know, she wears the t-shirt. He, he wears the cross. He's got the bumper sticker. He's always, you know, playing Christian music, talking a good one about God. But the guy's living with somebody or the girl's living with somebody they're not married to. Um, you know, the way that they talk, they're always using curse words. Man, I don't know much about the Bible, but I know enough to know that the Bible calls that sin. These people are living sin and, and you know, they're, 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 um, they're, they're living a life of sin, but claiming to have a relationship with Jesus. And you're going to be a joke. And not only do you become a joke, but you make the Bible a joke. You make God a joke. And, you know, we make other Christians a joke as well. It's a bad testimony. It doesn't help. It hurts, actually. And so, you know, we want to make sure that our, our, our lives are right with Christ uh, when we um, share him with other people so that we don't become a, a joke. Um, it says in, in you know, in, 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 this, in uh, chapter 19 here that Lot, Lot seems to have loved the city so much that when it was time to go, he wasn't thrilled about it. Verse 16 says he lingered, right? So he wasn't in a hurry to leave uh, the city. But then um, we see the nature of God here because it says that the men, the two men, the, the angels, uh, they took hold of his hand, his wife's hand, and the hand of his two daughters. It says, the Lord being merciful to him brought him out. So God is merciful for sure, but notice God never forces anybody to get saved. He doesn't force them. He doesn't manipulate them. And I think this is a very important point because there are pastors, there are Christians that somehow think that it's okay to try to manipulate somebody to get saved. They'd even try to trick them into saying some kind of a, you know, uh, a prayer of repentance. Ha ah, ha! See there, you said it. You're saved. Ha ha ha! You're saved. I don't see that it works that way in the Bible. That's a very serious commitment. That's a very serious decision, and I don't think anybody should make that decision by being manipulated or with their eyes closed. Um, God doesn't force Lot, his two daughters, and his wife to be saved from the destruction. Uh, verse 16 says that uh, they brought him out and set him outside of the city. But then in verse 17, the angels tell him, escape for your life. Escape to the mountains lest you be destroyed. So God was merciful that he brought him out of the city. But he's not going to do it all for them. At some point, they've got to make the decision to flee. And apparently, wherever it was that the angels took them uh, when they brought them outside of the city the destruction was going to be so much that they would have been destroyed even at that point. So they had to make a conscious decision to flee far enough away where they wouldn't be destroyed. And that they would have to do on their own. The angels didn't take them by the hand and take them into that mountain or, or the place that they went to after they left the city. So, you know, we, we uh, give our witness, our testimony, both in what we say and how we live. The rest is up to the people. We just want to make sure that our side of the street is clean, that our lifestyle reflects a good relationship with Jesus. And then we want to give them the facts as they're stated in the Bible. And we want to pray for them, of course. And that's all we do. Um, well, it, it says that uh, in verse 18, Then Lot said to them, speaking to the angels, Please, this is a trip, no, my lords, indeed now your servant has found favor in your sight and you have increased your mercy which you have shown me by saving my life. But here we go. This is the true nature of Lot. I cannot escape to the mountains lest some evil overtake me and I die. See now, this city is near enough to flee to and it's a little one. Please let me escape there. Is it not a little city? 
and my soul shall live. So after all the bad choices that Lot makes, he is still <clears throat> determined to choose for himself. And, and, and still, he loves the city life. The city life where all the action takes place, the lights, the music, the sin. He's in love with it, man. You can't pull him out of it. And he reminds me of some people in recovery. You know, they come in, they're so tired, they're so worn out, they're so willing, they're so surrendered. But the moment they feel just a little bit better, they insist on making all their decisions again. They insist on moving forward with all kinds of bad choices all over again. And I find that even with new Christians. And so... We want to be rooted. We want to be grounded. We want to have some Christian maturity in our life. We certainly want to uh, uh, absorb the Word of God before we come to that place where we're just making all kinds of decisions and making choices for ourselves. Because listen, man, we've got to consider our history. We've got to look back. That's what a four-step inventory is about. We've got to look back and realize, man, I am not the best judge of things. Look at the mess I've gotten myself into. And if you think, well, I'm not using drugs anymore. Certainly I can make my own choices. Remember what they read at the 12-step meetings? Drugs was just a symptom of a deeper-rooted problem. Listen, if you've eliminated the drugs from your life, that's wonderful. I applaud you. Hooray! But that was never the problem. The problem was centered in your thinking. The problem was your life void of Jesus Christ. Uh, find a place for those things and then make choices, then make decisions. Until then, just sit on your hands, read the Bible, study it. Uh, get into the Spirit and Truth uh, a podcast. We'll go through it with you. And then your mind is going to be transformed. Life's going to be different, and you're going to be making better choices. Uh, verse 21. And he said to them, or he said to him, See, I have favored you concerning this thing also, and that I will not overthrow this city for which you have spoken. Hurry, escape there. For I cannot do anything until you arrive there. Therefore, the name of the city was called Zor. Well, what are the angels telling Lot? Simply this. Look, that's not where we told you to go. But you're determined to do your own thing. So go ahead and go there. And uh, the name of the city is called Zor, which means little or it means uh, insignificant. And so, you know, one of the things that we see is that... Um, so many Christians, and they're saved, but they, they spend their lives living in fear of the devil. And there's no need for that. You know, I'm, I've been told, I haven't counted them, but I've been told that the Bible makes 365 references about fear and not to fear. And 365 just happens to be the number of days in our year. So it seems to me, if that's accurate, that every single day God tells us not to fear. Why would he tell us that? Why would he tell us that that many times? Obviously, because we fear. And we don't need to live in fear. And so here we see that good angels, these are good angels, and we read in other parts of Scripture, bad angels have no power over our lives except what the Lord gives them. And if the Lord gives them that power, like he did with Job, to uh, act in our lives, it is only to the degree that God allows, and it is only for the purposes of growing, our growing in faith, and understanding more the love and the mind of God. So we don't have to fear those things. But of course, Lot is a fearful guy because he's never given the word of God any space in his life. And that's just what happens with that. Verse 23, it says, The sun had risen upon the earth when Lot entered Zor. Then the Lord rained brimstone and fire on Sodom and Gomorrah from the Lord out of the heavens. And so he overthrew those cities, all the plain, all the inhabitants of the cities, and what grew on the ground. But his wife looked back behind him, and she became a pillar of salt. Wow. 
In verse 17, the angels told them, do not look behind you nor stay anywhere in the plain. And so having heard that from the angels, why does Lot's wife look back? Interesting question. Well, all that we're left to uh, consider here in regards to Lot's wife is that probably like her husband, she was very invested in those cities, in her relationships with friends and her in-laws, of course, her daughters that were left behind, probably her finances. They probably had some investments there. Remember, Lot, uh, he, he had money and he had cattle and he had gold and silver and he had servants. So they were very influential uh, people, probably her home. She probably loved her house. You know, we love our homes, especially if we've been living in our homes for a long time. There's some sentimental connections there. And so, you know, probably one or all of those reasons causes her to do what the angels told her not to do. She looked back. Wow. She looked back. It's important that we remember Lot's wife and, um, and what she did. In fact, uh, Jesus speaks of this. In uh, Luke chapter 17, verses 28 to 32, um, Jesus talks about uh, Lot's wife. And I'm going to read it to you. But before we do, let me tell you, let me remind you. If Jesus is mentioning Lot's wife, it's because she's a real person. And the story that we're reading about in, Luke, in Genesis chapter 19 is a real story. Jesus doesn't lie. Jesus says, as it was also in the days of Lot, they ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. But on the day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even so will it be in the day when the Son of Man, that is Jesus, is revealed. That's the second coming of Jesus Christ. In that day, he who is on the housetop and his goods are in the house, let him not come down to take them away. And likewise, the one who is in the field, let him not turn back. And then Jesus says this, remember Lot's wife. Wow, Jesus, remember Lot's wife, he says. You know, when we consider the future of the world in the book of Jude, uh, Peter writes about it in First and Second Peter, uh, the world is going to burn and everything in it is going to burn, just like Sodom and Gomorrah. Jesus says, remember Lot's wife. Why does he say that? You know, it's interesting that he says that because the Bible doesn't say much about her at all. We don't even know her name. The Bible doesn't even tell us her name. But what do we know about her? That she looked back and became paralyzed when she turned into a pillar of salt. You know, if we think about it, there's a lot of valuable application here. Because after we're saved, and we give our lives to Christ, we repent, um, you know, we're into the scripture, of course. Uh, we're part of a church where we're accountable and we're there all the time and we know our pastor and we know our congregation and we're serving, we're growing in the Lord. At that point, you know, if we choose to look back at our past and glamorize and yearn, you know, the good old days, you know, I've heard people in recovery with a lot of clean time, and they're doing well. But when they talk about the days of old and how they were in the penitentiary and the guys they were hanging around with, and you know, uh, the way they shot dope and how much dope and the music and all of that. You know, when we look back at our lives and we glamorize and we yearn the good old days, you know we stand the risk of becoming a pillar of salt. Because at that point, our spiritual journey, our walk with Jesus, our spiritual maturity, all of that becomes paralyzed in a moment, just like it did with Lot's wife. You know, this uh, old time uh, pastor who was around in the, the 30s, the 20s and the 30s, I believe. I like to listen to some of his sermons that I record. His name is Vance Havner. Vance Havner. He says that when it comes to this, uh, looking back at our past lives before we were saved, he says, time lends enchantment to the view. Time lends enchantment to the view. In other words, the longer, the further we've been removed from our past life, 
the more enchanting our past life seems to become in our sick little mind. Listen, we left our past life behind not because it was good, not because it was something to glamorize, not because they were the good old days. They were miserable. They were sinful. And had we stayed in those lives, we would burn in hell with the rest of the lost word, world. There was nothing good about our past life. Let's remember that. Let's not become paralyzed in our walk with Christ the way uh, Lot's wife did. Verse 27, And Abraham went early in the morning to the place where he had stood before the Lord. Then he looked toward Sodom and Gomorrah and toward all the land of the plain. And he saw, and behold, the smoke of the land, which went up like the smoke of a furnace, and it became, or and it came to pass when God destroyed the cities of the plain, that God remembered Abraham. And let me just say, he never forgot Abraham, but he's coming back to Abraham now. And sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow when he overthrew the cities in which Lot had dwelt. Listen, God saved Lot in part. I'm sure there were other reasons, but in part because of his relationship with Abraham and because of Abraham's prayers. But in chapter 18, or I, I shouldn't say but, it, you know, in chapter 18, Abraham prayed, if you recall, for all of the people in Sodom and Gomorrah to be saved. All of them. And that includes Lot. That includes Lot's family, which were family to Abraham. But also all of the homosexual community. You know, we may not like everybody. Um, we may have difficulty liking people more than others. Uh, and, and, and God is not going to do everything that we ask, right? Let's not kid ourselves into thinking that He's going to do everything that we pray to do for Him to do. But regardless of that, as His people, okay, He owns us now. We're bond servants, okay? We're willing servants of God. He owns us now. We're supposed to pray for all people. And whatever God does after that is up to Him to work things out according to His eternal plan. But our job is to pray for all people. And we are to love the sinners, but hate the sin. Everything from you know practicing drug addicts and what they do, to the homosexual community, to violent people, to God-haters, you name it. We're supposed to be praying for these people. And we don't love their sin, but we love the people because God loves the people. Uh, verse 30, Then Lot went up out of Zor and dwelt in the mountains. So he doesn't even end up going to the city that he said that he wanted to go to, the city that he chose. He didn't even go there. This guy's so messed up. And his two daughters were with him. For he was afraid to dwell in Zar. There you go, afraid again, right? A believer who doesn't know God's word is always going to be afraid. And he and his two daughters dwelt in a cave. Now the firstborn said to the younger, Our father is old, and there is no man on the earth to come into us, as is the custom of all the earth. That's not true. They were just in the city of Zor, and there were men there. So they knew full well that God didn't wipe out the whole world. Okay, so they're rationalizing, justifying, and lying to come to the conclusion that they're going to come to here in verse 32. She says to her younger sister, Come, let us make our father drink wine, and we will lie with him. This is speaking intimately again, right? They're going to have sex with their father, is what she's saying. That we may preserve the lineage of our father. So they made their father drink wine that night. And the firstborn went in and lay with her father, and he did not know when she lay down or when she arose. It happened on the next day that the firstborn said to the younger, Indeed, I lay with my father last night. Let us make him drink wine tonight also, and you go in and lie with him, that we may preserve the lineage of our father. Then they went, made their father drink wine that night also, and the younger daughter arose and lay with him, and he did not know when she lay down or when she arose. Thus, both the daughters of Lot were with child by their father. The firstborn, the firstborn bore a son and called his name Moab. He is the father of the Moabites to this day. And the younger, she also bore a son and called his name Ben-Ami. 
he is the father of the people of Amon to this day. Um, so, you know, what a sad, disappointing story. You know, if Hollywood wanted to write a, a story that was sad, they couldn't even come close to this one, as talented as they are. You know, Lot had so much opportunity through God and, and, and through the example of his uncle Abraham, who did so well. And, and he had so much potential and, and there's so much that he could have offered his family, but because he was always led by the lust of his eyes, because he always chose for himself, he never bothered to consider God's word. He never bothered to consider the fact that God had a plan for his life. He was a mess. You know, Lot, like so many men today, he just lived for himself. And it seemed like a good idea in the beginning. And it was exciting even maybe. You know, guys like to live on the edge, man, especially my uh, addicted brothers and, sister and sisters. We like to live on the edge. That's part of the reason why we use dope. But in the end, Lot's whole family suffered. His son-in-laws, they lost all respect for him when he was probably the most serious time. You got to get out of here, guys. God's going to destroy the city. They thought he was joking. Hey, there's my father-in-law again. That guy's such a joke, man. Nobody takes that guy serious. He's so confused, you know. Um, Lot got drunk in the end. He has sex. He has an incestual affair with his two daughters. You say, well, he got drunk. Well, he got drunk. That's just added sin and then of course if as we read further we're going to discover that the children that were born to his daughters these young boys that he was the father of so he's the grandfather and the father of these two boys they become israel's enemies for hundreds of years to come the ammonites and the moabites are going to be israel's enemies for hundreds of years to come until israel finally uh, wipes them out and it's interesting to me because I know so many men who uh, are or presently living like Lot. You know, maybe they're not having sex with their daughters, but they're making all their own decisions. They never consider God's word or his plan for their lives. They always want to be where the action is. They take on all kinds of horrible information and they take it to the bank and they deposit it into their account of morality and spirituality. And there's so much bad information in there. And, you know, that's one thing. But then they begin to act on that information and life becomes a disaster. Maybe not right away, but in the end, for sure. Let's learn from the example of Lot's life. I would encourage you to have faith. A lot of people talk about faith. That little word that so many me people mention in their share or in their casual conversations that they have during the day. Hey, keep the faith. Well, I'm going to have to stand on faith. You know, and when I had four years clean, I got faith. And it's an easy word to throw out there. But faith really and truly is that moment in time when we take God at his word and live according to his word because we believe his word. And if we're not doing that, we can talk all we want about faith. But faith is an action word. And um, it is an action that uh, God intended for us to take. And without it, we're, we're lost and we're headed for destruction. And not just us, but family and friends, people that we sponsor. So I want to encourage you to uh, if you're not saved get saved and if you can't do that at least start reading the bible uh, father we love you lord we thank you we pray for those who are lost father we pray for addicts we pray for the homosexual community we pray for so many men who are sitting in a penitentiary somewhere thinking where did i go wrong father may they find you may you surround these people with christians may you make their hearts ready to receive what will be shared with them the gospel lord that you love them that they're living lives that you never wanted for them and that you're still available that you will save them from a life of destruction but they must go your way because the world is not on their side and neither is their sin 
Father, we entrust you with their lives. Thank you so much. We pray that you would do in their lives even what you've done in our own. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Thank you so much, Father. And God bless all of you, our audience of the Spirit and Truth podcast. We'll be in chapter 20 very soon. Jesus, thank you.